The Mr. FPGA project has been one of the most exciting things to ever happen in retro gaming. From its zero latency hardware emulation to core developers pushing that emulation even farther than original hardware can go, it's truly been a game changer. Getting started with only HDMI output is really easy. I did a video a while back that walks people through it in about 10 minutes at the lowest cost possible. Trying to find the right analog video option and the proper kit to go with it has been a bit trickier, until now. Developer Ivory from Retro Castle has always made my favorite Mr. Kits, and his latest options should cover everyone's needs. So let's take a look. Here's a brief overview of the kits. Each model of these compact, well-built cases are barely bigger than the DE-10 itself, but feature quite a bit. All have two USB ports on the front, as well as a USB bridge that connects the DE-10's USB port to the Retro Castle USB hub. It's odd having the Ethernet jack in front, but please remember that's built into the DE-10 itself, which was designed as a dev kit, not a video game console. On one side is a USB port, as well as the user I.O. snack port. The snack port looks like USB, but it's actually a serial connection designed for light guns and other peripherals that need a direct connection. Basically, just don't plug standard USB devices into dedicated snack ports on any Mr. Kit. Just stick to the devices that were designed specifically for Mr. Snack Ports. On the top are the standard buttons to reboot the Mr., reboot just the core, and bring up the on-screen menu. And there's also a power button. You wouldn't think that's a big deal, but most other enclosures require an external power switch or offer none at all, which is really annoying. An integrated power button is made possible by using a USB-C jack for power input. Don't use the barrel input for the DE10, simply use a tablet quality USB-C power brick, and that input will power both the IO kit and the DE10. A few quick notes on this though. The kit comes with an adapter to use the power supply bundled with the DE10 through the USB-C port. That should be fine, however, the more accessories you connect to the USB ports, the more power is drawn. I prefer to use a higher amperage PSU with my Mr., but honestly, if you don't have much plugged into the USB ports, it should be totally fine to just use the bundled DE10 power supply. Also, if you forget and plug the DE10's power into the barrel jack instead of the USB connector, no big deal. The DE10 will turn on, but not the I.O. board or anything connected. Definitely don't connect both a USB and barrel jack power at the same time, but if you forget like I often do and sometimes just try to power it by the DE10's power input, it shouldn't be a big deal at all. On the other side is another standard USB port, and the analog models feature dip switches for output options. The rear is where most of the differences are. First, the HDMI-only model won't offer any analog outputs at all. This is great for people on a budget, people who know they'll never use a CRT anyway, or people who've already bought a direct video solution. The HDMI model is also compatible with both single and dual RAM setups. I'll go over dual RAM and how that applies to which model you should buy later in this video. Then there's two versions with a Sega Saturn mini DIN output. These versions are recommended for people who want easy composite or S-video output, as well as RGB. The dip switches on the side make this easy to configure alongside the Mr. I and I file. Just remember to always use well-built Saturn cables and C-Sync RGB SCART cables are recommended for this case. You can still get component video from the Saturn version using those dips, and there's a pretty cheap cable that'll make that easy. That said, if your target devices are mainly component video or VGA, the versions with the D-sub connector are definitely a better choice. You could get YPVPR via a cheap adapter cable, and any standard VGA cable will work for both RGBS and RGBHV. Of course, you could still get RGB SCART from the D-sub model using something like an HD15 to SCART, and composite and S-video will also work with adapters. I'd just choose your model based on which formats you'd use the most. These Retro Castle kits have a few options for audio output. The single RAM kits offer audio using the same circuit that Sorg designed for the original I.O. boards. 
These will output both analog and digital audio from the 3.5mm jack, and the Saturn versions will also have analog audio through the mini DIN. As a note, any stereo 3.5mm cable would work for analog audio, and a mini Toslink cable gets you true digital audio output with a standard SPDIF connector on the other end. Ivory also has an option for an I2S module, which uses a custom digital to analog audio converter to upgrade the audio quality. This requires you to flip the dip switch on the DE10 to send digital audio to the DAC, and you'll get this upgrade through both the 3.5mm and Saturn ports. Please note that flipping that switch disables the digital audio signal from the 3.5mm jack. You can always flip the switch back to re-enable it, but if you're buying the I2S upgrade, you're probably focused on analog audio anyway. I just want to be clear about the DE10's dip switches, as this can get confusing. For standard single RAM configurations, including the HDMI only kit, leave all the switches in their default position. If you're using the I2S module audio upgrade, flip the one closest to the ethernet port. And if you're using dual RAM, make sure they're all back to the default position except the one closest to the HDMI port. Speaking of dual RAM, that version requires digital to analog conversion on both the audio and video side. For audio, it uses the same DAC chip as the HD Fury 3, which is a tiny bit better quality than the I2S version. The HDMI only version is fully digital, so it only outputs digital audio through the 3.5mm jack, not analog at all. I'll have examples later of how they sound, so we'll swing back to this in a bit. As a note, Retrocastle also sells JAMA version of these kits, and I've been testing them for a few years now. They perform equally as well as the cases that I show in this video, and if you're converting an arcade machine to run off a mister, I would definitely recommend it. However, this video is focused on the regular cases, not arcade setups. I'll link to another video I did for arcade stuff, and I'll do another video on Mr. JAMA at some point in the future. Just know that the Retro Castle solutions are great choices for JAMA. And that's the basic overview, but in order to choose the case that's right for your setup, you're going to need to know the differences between single RAM and dual RAM versions, which I'll go over in a bit. But first, I want to jump into some performance testing to prove with technical details why these are my favorite cases, not just the form and function. While many other Mr. Kits offer analog video output, the performance can vary greatly, so let's put this on the scope to show what it could do. I'll be connecting it using a properly made Sega Saturn RGB cable and loading a core that has a test pattern which could output the brightest signal possible, which is either an all-white screen or 100% color bars in order to do this properly. Now I'll measure the voltage output on the sink as well as the RGB lines. The Retro Castle cases output about 384 millivolts on sync, which is perfect, high enough to be detected by all SCART devices, but well under the safety limit. And just a quick side note, it doesn't matter if you're using original consoles, this Mr. Case, somebody else's Mr. Case, always make sure to use properly built cables from reputable vendors. I've done so many videos and topics on this over the years, and I just want to drive the point home again, using a bad cable could ruin your whole setup, either in video quality or sometimes even safety issues. Anyway, now let's look at the RGB output. We get a rating of just about 700 millivolts, which is perfect. Getting the right voltage output is so important, and here's why. Technically, analog video should always be 714 millivolts on the RGB lines, but nothing's ever exact in the analog world, and there's always tolerances. I'd say RGB voltage as low as about 600 millivolts should be totally fine. And if you think it's a bit dim, just turn the brightness up on your display until it looks right. As you can see here, all the color steps are visible just by turning up some brightness. To oversimplify, this isn't quite as good as the previous example, but it's totally fine. Voltage over 700 millivolts and up to just under a volt should be safe, but here's where it gets interesting. The moment you start going over 714, you lose detail. Even if you turn the brightness on your display down, the image was already washed out and you can't get that data back. I couldn't think of a better example than what I'm showing right now. Even though it's about the same percentage difference than the dim example, this too bright example has so much of the image lost and it can't be recovered by just turning the brightness down. Now, analog displays are a lot more tolerant than the digital capture that I just showed. And sure, you could just mess with the brightness knob a bit, but that's not gonna compensate for gray levels. 
Now, you could recalibrate your entire CRT around that output, and that happens all the time in the arcade world, which is why this really isn't that big of a deal when you're talking about JAMA output. However, if you're talking about a consumer CRT or your RGB monitor, that means you would have to then recalibrate it back every single time you switched back to original consoles, which is why it's so awesome that Ivory uses 0.1% tolerant resistors on the RGB lines to keep them around 700 millivolts and also to keep the colors almost exactly the same on each of the lines. And while it's not realistic to have that perfect on every single output that you find, it's awesome that the effort's there in order to make that happen. See, many original consoles have a discrepancy between the voltages on each color, and it's usually not anything that could be noticeable by the human eye on any display. That said, the closer the RGB voltages are to each other, the better. And that's even true for S-Video and composite output. If the RGB voltages aren't correct, it'll mix down looking just as off balance. The fact that the retro castle cases have all three the same at a good voltage ensures you're getting a quality output signal. If you'd like to test this yourself, all you need is the free 240p test suite for any Mr. Core. Just load up the color bar pattern and take a screenshot. If you're a nerd like me, you could test the voltage using oscilloscopes, and I even have a video showing how to perform the same tests using one that costs less than $40. In fact, I really hope you do decide to test, as it's important to know if your Mr. Vendor could be trusted to test their products before shipping. While high-quality analog video output is always appreciated, Ivory also dedicated a lot of time to getting high-quality analog audio output. Now, of course, this all starts with the amazing core developers who painstakingly reverse-engineer these chips to get us really accurate audio compared to original consoles. So if you're using the digital HDMI or SPDIF outputs, just enjoy all the work the FPGA devs put into audio emulation and let your receiver do all the conversion. But if you're using analog audio, I think Ivory's provided some options that could result in as high a quality a signal as possible for the price. Now that last term, for the price, is something you'll hear me say every single time I talk about audio equipment, because it's just not fair to take things out of context and compare an audio DAC built into a video game console to a multi-thousand dollar super high-end home audio DAC that you might find in really crazy setups. So in context, I think that the audio DAC built into these cases are at the very least equal to original consoles. Here's some examples, but please keep in mind video streaming compression and how you're listening might make all of these sound the same. Still, check it out. Now, respectfully, if you're just using your TV speakers for gaming, you're probably not going to be able to hear the difference between any of these DACs, and that's totally fine. That said, if you have some really nice shielded speakers next to your CRT, and I just did a video on some new Kanto Auras that sound awesome, then you'll appreciate these differences a lot more. So now that you've been brought up to speed on the general overview of these kits, as well as performance, it's finally time to talk about single versus dual RAM options. Up until recently, all Mr. Cores and kits supported one RAM stick and used the DE10's other pins for analog video with 18-bit color, or nothing at all if you didn't have an I.O. board. While all official cores currently run with only one RAM stick, some beta cores require a second RAM stick, and there's upcoming cores that may require dual as well. If you're interested in the HDMI-only version of the Retro Castle case, then you really don't need to worry about any of this. Either save some cash and buy it with one RAM stick, or future-proof it by adding a cheap 32 megabyte RAM stick in the second slot. To be honest, if you only need HDMI output and don't care about analog at all, you already have all of the information you need and you could just skip the rest of this section entirely. If simultaneous dual output is important to you, basically 240p going into your CRT from one output and the HDMI output running in HD resolution to a capture card or flat panel at the exact same time, then stick with the single RAM version. 
I've been using the RetroCastle analog kits since they were first released, and they perform equal to or better than any other single RAM Mr. I.O. kit on the market, as I just demonstrated in the last section. Due to a limitation of the DE10's available FPGA pins, if you need analog video output while using dual RAM, you're required to use the HDMI-based direct video mode. And to be clear, that's with all kits, not just the Retro Castle ones. Direct video is one of the rare cases of something that's super easy to use, but sounds complicated when being discussed in situations like this. As a result, I'm going to be doing a completely separate video on direct video and stay on topic in this video and just focus on the Retro Castle cases. That said, here is a very brief overview. Direct video sends a signal through the DE10's HDMI port that's compatible with CRTs when used with digital to analog converters, or DACs for short. The downside of this is since you're using the HDMI port, you don't have dual output options like you do using an I.O. board based single RAM kit. The advantage of direct video over the I.O. board is if you find the right DAC, you can get a slightly higher quality 24-bit color output. Good DACs are much harder to find than you might think, but luckily the Retro Castle cases have models with one built right in. If you're okay with only one output at a time, you can get a D-Sub or Saturn version of the kit that will work with both single and dual RAM configurations. They work via a ribbon cable with an HDMI connector at the end. For standard HDMI out, leave it disconnected. If you need analog video output, simply connect this cable and the circuit on the inside will do all the conversion for you. No black level issues, no issue with cheap DAC consistency, just a good DAC that was implemented specifically for the purpose of Mr. Direct Video. Now, I know I said I wasn't getting into detail about Direct Video, but I want to show a really cool trick you could use with these cases that makes switching between HDMI and analog out really easy. Start by downloading the latest Mr. INI file from the GitHub to your micro SD. If you already have one configured, you could just use that. Then set the HDMI output to whatever you'd normally use. I'll set 1080p here and configure the analog options. Since I'm using RGB, I'll set VGA mode to RGB, composite sync to one and set direct video to one. When you're done, save the file and exit. Now make a copy and rename it Mr. Underscore HDMI INI or anything with a max of four letters after the underscore. Open that file and simply set direct video back to zero. Doing this will set the default INI file to always boot in a mode that's safe to use on CRTs. Check this out though. While still connected to a CRT, power off, then power it back on while holding the OSD button. You'll eventually get a screen that shows which direction on your D-pad or keyboard will be mapped to the other INI file you created. Write this down so you don't forget. Now you're done with CRT configuration, but what if you want to sometimes connect it to a flat panel via an HDMI cable? No problem. Simply unplug the HDMI bridge, connect an HDMI cable, and hold the OSD button for about 10 seconds after powering on. After counting to 10, while still holding the OSD button, just hit the corresponding arrow that you wrote down before. And you've booted into normal HDMI mode. Now, obviously this isn't as easy as just having a dual outputting I.O. board like the single RAM versions, but if you want the ability to run dual RAM or you just wanted the slightly higher quality 24-bit output, it's a small price to pay and still pretty convenient. So basically, if simultaneous analog and digital outputs, each at their own separate resolutions, is something that's really important to you, definitely stick with the single RAM cases. And if not, maybe consider the dual RAM compatible versions. Maybe the slight boost in audio and video quality is something that interests you. Maybe just the ability to eventually add a second RAM stick should that become a requirement on some cores is something that you'd need. Or if you don't want to think about any of this, just get the HDMI only case and you could always add an external DAC later on. Just because the Retro Castle kits have been my favorite for a long time now, doesn't mean there aren't other good options out there. So I want to take a moment to shout out some other kits that you might be interested in. The first shout out goes to any cheap kit that helps people get started on a budget, like the Atlantis kits that start at just $11. It's a mini ITX board, which means you could use it in almost any PC case you might just have lying around. Seriously, thank you to anyone who takes the time to help people get started at the lowest price possible. The fact is, not everyone needs fancy features, and just having some basic options is really awesome. Another great choice is the Jamix kit. 
It has some excellent options, including a JAMA output and even a way to run stereo audio through the JAMA connector for custom cabinets. Modern Vintage Gamer has been using this in his videos for a few years, and it's a great choice if you want a completely feature-packed option. The Mr. Multi system is also great, and one of the only solutions that kind of looks like what you'd expect from a retro gaming console. I really love that all the ports are in back, with the only connections in front being the USB controller ports. I think that small detail really goes a long way to make it feel like a console, and it looks great. There's even multiple case options that even sort of resemble an original console brand. It's a lot bigger than a Retro Castle case though, but that might not be an issue for you. Unfortunately, the original creators aren't selling them anymore. The project has been completely open sourced though, but you'd have to find a store that builds them to the same quality as the originals, and making your own would be really tough. And once again, there's other good kits out there. I'm simply mentioning the ones that I've had a lot of experience with that I would absolutely stand by my recommendations. Just be careful, as with everything in the tech world, there's also a lot of garbage out there and a lot of stuff that looks cool but doesn't perform really well. So if you're ever curious, see if anybody's done any of the same tests that I showed here in order to prove that their kit performs just as well as the Retro Castle kit. So there you have it, a complete overview of what have been my favorite Mr. FPGA kits and cases for a couple of years now. What do you think? Are you gonna test your current kit and see if it's worth upgrading? Do you not have a kit at all and are definitely gonna buy this one? Or are some of the other options that I showed things that you might be more interested in that might fit your setup a little bit better? Definitely let me know in the comments. I also want to take a moment to shout out and thank every single person who contributes to the Mr. FPGA project in absolutely any way. Sometimes it's very easy to get focused in on hardware options and accessories and kind of skip over how much unbelievable work has gone into getting these FPGA cores working as well as they do. So thank you so much to everybody else involved. Also, as always, I want to disclose that I have been a beta tester of Retro Castle cases for a long time now. I mentioned it a bunch of times in this video, I've talked about it in many other videos, so I just want to be completely transparent and say that I do have an open dialogue with Ivory, I've loved working with him, but if you think that any of my comparisons or any of my analysis is biased, I show all of the work that I do, so please feel free to rerun any of these tests on your own and double check. And honestly, that's something that I hope that you do, because when people take the time to make good equipment, they want you to check it. They want you to put it on a scope or fire up those color bars, and they want you to see how much effort has been put into the thing that they've spent a long time perfecting. So please do double check me and every other case you have out there. Speaking of disclosures, I'll also be using affiliate links for absolutely everything possible in the description, as that's a big part of how this channel is able to stay afloat. Also, RetroRGB recently turned off all Google Ads to try and improve the user experience. This is only possible due to amazing monthly supporters on platforms like Floatplane and Patreon. There's other ways to help if you'd like, though. You could use general affiliate links to buy the exact same stuff you were gonna buy from Amazon or eBay at the exact same price, but we'd get a small cut. And thanks to Artistic Pixels, there's also a bunch of very awesome retro RGB merch that's available if that's something that interests you. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.